Trout fishing is red hot at Collins Lake. Check out these awesome rainbows my clients have landed this fall. Join me on the FHS pontoon boat and learn my proven methods for catching more and bigger trout up close and hands on. To book your trip now, go to fishhuntshoot.com and we'll be yelling fish on. Collins Lake, baby. <laughs> man, oh man. Folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm Kel Kellogg, and I'm kind of in, uh, you know, recovery mode here after a huge series of snowstorms march through the Sierras. I'm here in the Sierra foothills. I typically get very little, if any, snow. Well, I had 20 inches of snow over the last few days, and uh, it's done a crazy amount of damage here in my neighborhood. Trees are down, power lines are down. Um, it was gridlocked for a few days. I haven't had power now for three or four days. I can't even remember. It all kind of runs together. Um, this video, this isn't a fishing video. This is a video I wish I would have seen when I moved up here to the mountains. And, and here's kind of the scope, you know. I was born in Oakland, California. I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, I wanted to move to the country. And uh, there are certain challenges that confront you when you move to the country. Now, I know there's some people that live in the valley that are thinking of moving up to the foothills or maybe some people in the foothills that are thinking of moving up, you know, higher in the mountains. Maybe there's somebody in the Bay Area that's getting ready to retire and they're thinking about moving to, say, Idaho. That seems to be a really popular destination. This video is, is going to be just some tips that I have learned. Um, people have helped me and things that I've learned on my own about what to expect, what you need, what you're gonna have to be able to do if you move up to the country, okay? And I'm gonna start out with my generator. I am not a mechanical guy, but I'll tell you what, when your power is out, not for an hour or two, but for a day or two, or maybe five days or eight days, I've had my power out up here for nine days straight, and uh, when that happens, you, you learn real quick how much you rely on electricity. So I'm gonna walk over here, I'm gonna show you my generator and uh, I'll talk about the generator, how it works and the system that I have. Join you at the generator. Okay, that right there is my generator. Got it at Home Depot a couple years ago. It's a champion. I've used it quite a bit. I give it a B minus. It's a 9200 watt model. It's got 1100 and 11,500 starting watts. Got no idea what that means. Running watts, 9200. This isn't quite big enough to power my house, but uh, it allows me to run a pretty normal lifestyle when the power is out. Now, as you know, if you live here in California, we have the fire power outages when the wind blows in the late fall and the summertime. Um, PG&E, they've started a number of fires, so when they've got fire weather, they turn off the power. Um, and when you have a, a big winter storm like, like we just had, and we're locked in snow and the lines are down, you're going to be uh, without power for a sustained period of time. So this is the generator, but it, it doesn't stop there. That's the least of your worries in terms of getting power to your house. Let me walk you over here. Now check this out, all right? And and if you talk to some, you know, Joe Handyman types, they're gonna tell you, well, all you need to do is hook, a, hook an electrical cord to your generator, plug it into where your dryer hooks up, and you'll backfeed your house. All you have to do is turn off the, the main, you know, shut off to your house, okay? What you're looking at right here, this is what I call my transfer box. I had this put in by a professional electrician, and he told me, if you try to backfeed your generator into your house without having one of these boxes, you're asking to start a fire, and uh, you know, I don't want a fire. So, what you're looking at here, these are the circuits that power my house right here. If I'm running on generator, I snap these up to generator mode. Um, right now, the generator is not running, they're in off mode, and when the uh, when the power comes back on from the utility company, I'll snap them all down into line mode, which means power from outside. That box right there, it cost me about $300, and the electrician charged me $500 
to install the box. Now, now, if you know how to do a, electrical work and you know if you know, you know what I mean? If you know how to do electrical work, you can get that box from Home Depot, you can wire it in yourself. If you don't know how to deal with electrical work, hire the electrician. Get it done right. You don't want to fire. You don't want to electrocute yourself. Get a professional. Let's talk a little bit more about the generator itself. Okay, we're back to the generator. Now, as I said, I am not mechanical. Um, if I didn't say that, I'm not mechanical, okay? But here's some, some points about generators. The reason I give this generator a B minus is, see that on and off, it's got the push button start. That toggle button, it's already starting to go bad. Um, it makes a funny noise once in a while. And uh, I'm not a thousand percent confident in this generator. So I've actually ordered myself a second generator to act as a backup for this generator because I don't wanna be without power. One of the things I was told early on about running generators is that you have to change the oil in them religiously. This thing takes a quart of 10W30 oil. And one of the reasons it's not running right now is I'm about to change the oil because I change the oil in it religiously. I'm not sure what happens if you don't change the oil, a bad things happen. That's what happens. So I'm going to change the oil here before I fire it back up because I still don't have power. Check this out. This was... This was kind of trial and error on my part. This is the world's largest funnel, okay? That's where the gas goes right there. You try to pour gas in that tiny little hole when it's cold and dark, and maybe you've been running the generator and it's hot, the last thing you want to do is spill gas. So that is a lot easier to hit than that tiny little hole right there. Along those same lines, when you set your generator up, obviously don't set it up in your living room it spits out exhaust there is the exhaust system right there notice how i've got it aimed out at the driveway don't rub your leg up against it don't aim it at your newspaper collection don't aim it at your gas can it gets hot so think about that see how i've got it up on those cement blocks you want your generator level you just want to set the stage for success Let's walk over here. I just got back from town. Let's walk over here. Back to the world of ice and snow. And you'll see what I have in my truck. 10 gallons of gas, okay? So don't forget this. The generator runs on gas. So you don't want to be the guy going into an emergency situation that has two gallons of gas. I don't even know how much that that thing holds. I think it holds eight or nine gallons of gas. I do know if I run it all day, it takes five gallons of gas. My power's out for five days, it takes 25 gallons of gas. I've been running it for a few days now. Every time I get an opportunity to get out between the snow and when the road's clear and stuff like that, I refill the gas cans that I've you know emptied. You can you know, store your, your gas cans in a safe area. Never store them in the garage, you'll build up fumes. You wanna store them outside in a dry, shady place that has as stable a temperature as possible, okay? I try to keep 40 or 50 gallons of gas locked away in my backyard in a locked shed. Um, some guys like to take their gas and they'll cycle their gas. They'll put five gallons in their truck, they'll refill it, and that way they ensure that they always have fresh gas. I do that sometimes, but what I like to do, I just make sure that when I'm gonna store the gas for you know a month or more, I put the fuel stabilizer in it. That's gonna eliminate problems with your equipment and have some gas cans. I prefer five gallon cans. And you know, if you're not a big strapping boy like me, you might want two and a half gallon cans, something that's easy to handle. But the bottom line is I don't use those gas cans for anything but my generator fuel. I don't do mixed gas in them, none of that. I want as clean and as pure a gas as I can get for that generator because when I need the generator, I need the generator. And I, I don't want a failure due to bad gas. So that's my power system, that's the power supply. Um, that's how that works. Let me walk you around the property here and show you a couple other things that uh, you might want to consider, okay? 
first and foremost, I see this right here. Just put this down here. Actually, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll just hold it up like this. This is my snow shovel. Okay, wrong kind of shovel for the snow. I use it. It's fine. It's a metal shovel. The snow wants to stick to it. You absolutely need a snow shovel if you're going to live where it might snow. Spring for one of the plastic snow scoop type ones because the snow doesn't stick to those. I make you with this unit. But uh, one of these days, I just haven't got around to getting one yet. I've got, uh, I've got to get myself one of those plastic ones. But for now, this is working okay. But uh, it's not optimum. So let's have a look around here. I want to show you. I'm going to stick this in the snow right here. I want to turn this camera around and show you my stairs. And I get it. This is a wonky video. I've only got one of my cameras out right now. Now, see that white stuff on my stairs? Can I go up there? That is not ice, okay? What that is, let me hold some up to the camera here. That is rock salt, okay? So let me tell you the deal on rock salt. You can get rock salt like that at Home Depot at the hardware store. You can get the stuff used for water softening machines. I guess there's various uses for it. If you are in freezing conditions and you have snow or moisture involved, if you have a deck, or stairs or asphalt anywhere there's not snow on the ground if you don't want to fall down and bust your head or break your elbow or snap your ankle or something fun like that you need to put down rock salt not only does it break up the ice and kind of prevent ice from forming but it also gives you some traction even if there's ice on the ground when you put the salt down think about it that snow thaws all day everything's coated with water Guess what happens when the sun goes down? Everything freezes and it will turn your deck into an absolute skating rink and you will fall down if you don't have rock salt on it. Is rock salt good for your deck? Probably not. I don't know. If you don't want rock salt on your deck, don't move up where there's snow. Let's go over to the deck here. Got a couple points about my deck. There's my deck. It's elevated. It's up there. It's pretty big. Not sure how big. It's about 40 feet long. And man, it used some pretty big lumber to make that deck. I didn't build it. Don't know if it was engineered by an architect, but this is what I do know. I love my deck and snow is heavy, okay? Now, when snow first falls, it's not so bad. It's like shoveling sawdust, okay? You let that snow start to melt and start to compact, it's not so fun to shovel. It's like shoveling ice because but it's ice, okay? If you walk around on it, it's gonna turn to ice. So my advice through this series of storms, I shoveled off that deck three different times. I don't know what the weight rating on that deck is. I know I don't want it to collapse and I know I didn't wanna shovel it off, you know, at the end of the storm. Even if my deck didn't collapse, I don't want my, uh, my, my deck covered in ice. So every morning after it snowed, I just took, you know, 30, 40 minutes. I'm stuck here at home. What else am I gonna do? I shoveled off the deck. It's better to be safe than sorry. Now let's kind of walk up property here. I'll take you around to Suburban. Here we go. I'm almost done. Everything takes longer in the snow. Something that would, you know, take a minute takes three minutes. Something that took 10 minutes is gonna take 30 minutes. I want you to look up there. See that cedar tree right there? It's laying on the power line that goes to my house. Now, pg and is gonna come out here and they're gonna fix it. But having said that, my entire backyard is littered with broken trees. My fence got crushed. My neighbor has some livestock. He has some goats, chickens, ducks, and whatnot. I have Lucy the dog. We didn't want our animals mixing or getting away. So we had to go out there, we had to remove the timber and we had to fix the fence. What am I getting at here? If you move to the country, you need a good sized chainsaw, either a Husqvarna or a steel. Steel, those are the two most reliable brands. I've talked to everybody. There's Husqvarna guys and there's steel guys. They're like Ford and Chevy guys. I'm a Husqvarna guy, okay? Get a good sized saw. Get some practice with it. Know this, 
Chainsaws are extremely dangerous, even in dry optimum conditions, okay? So, practice with it when it's dry because it's even more dangerous in the snow. Get a hard hat with a mesh face cover and get chainsaw chaps. Chainsaw chaps are canvas on the outside and they're full of string. You cut through the chap, the string stops the chainsaw from running and keeps you from sawing your leg, okay? Invest in the chaps. They're 80 bucks, maybe 100 bucks now. Get the chaps, but get yourself a decent sized chainsaw. You might wake up in the morning and there's a tree across your driveway and that's the only thing preventing you from going to town and getting more fuel for the generator. So you're gonna need a chainsaw, okay? Along those lines, chainsaws, and fire extinguishers go hand in hand. I have fire extinguishers all over my property here. I've got one in my office, one in my kitchen, couple in my garage, one near the generator where I'm pouring the gas, one that I bust out with my chainsaw. Now, when I'm knee deep in snow running a chainsaw, I don't get out the fire extinguisher, but if it's not, if I don't have snow or moist ground that I'm working on, I just matter of routine, grab the fire extinguisher because it's a lot easier to put out a fire when it first starts than when it's starting to climb up a tree or something like that. Remember, you're in the, in the country. You're a long way from the fire station and from the police and all that kind of stuff. You've got to be prepared to handle things on your own for some period of time. Think ahead. Think what bad thing could happen when I'm doing this activity and try to mitigate the effects of that. Let's get to my driveway. Last but not least, let's get to my driveway and talk a bit about vehicles. That white vehicle over there, that is my wife's Ford. It is two wheel drive and as you can see, it hasn't moved since the snow started. This is my Chevy Suburban. It is a monster. It loves gas, it drinks gas like crazy. It is four wheel drive and it is heavy. Heavy vehicles in the snow are your friend. The Suburban, it, it weighs a little over 8,000 pounds and it is a snow eating beast. <laughs> Having said that, snow and ice are two different things. I could have, here's my driveway going up here. I could have 20 inches of snow in this driveway. Snow and the, the, the Chevy will go right up the driveway. If my driveway was coated with ice like that, three quarters of an inch thick, Four-wheel drive does nothing, does nothing for me. So what I've been very careful to do, you see how there's two tracks going all the way up my driveway? That didn't get there by accident. I cleared this off with that little shovel I showed you. And it goes all the way up to the top here. Now in the morning, I don't salt this, it is icy. But my, uh, my Chevy can negotiate that thin ice when I walk up the driveway though, I'm careful to stay on the snow if I think it's frozen. But I, I cleared those two tracks just so I can get up the driveway and I suspect there's no more snow in the forecast. I'm gonna clear some wheel ruts out for my wife's truck and I think she's gonna be able to drive herself to work tomorrow. I've been taking her back and forth to town so she can get some work in and take care of her clients. She owns a beauty salon and uh, it's important that she's there because we're coming up on New Year's. People want to look good, all that, blah, blah, blah. So I've been taking my wife to work in the morning, picking her up at night in the four wheel drive. But uh, by clearing these two ruts in the road, I ensure that I'm going to be able to get out and my wife's going to be able to get out as early as possible. If I just left the snow cover the driveway, it's going to turn to ice and I don't know how long it's going to take this to melt. It might still have snow on it in a week. So and uh, I don't have a week to wait around for the snow to melt. I need to get out and about and do stuff and so does my wife. So that's kind of just some of the notes that, that I've learned living here in the country. I know some of you guys, like I said, you're thinking of moving to Idaho or Wyoming or wherever. Maybe you're just moving up to the Sierras. It is very rewarding living up here in the mountains, but you need to be prepared and you need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. I've been living in this house for going on seven years. This is the first time I've had big snow like this. I've had snow here before, but I've never had anything approaching 20 inches before. Um, so 
it's important to have a plan, have some gas, the generator, the saw, stuff like that. Have a supply of food and keep your eye on the weather. What's going on? Am I going to have fire weather in August or September, October or November? Are they going to turn off my power? Is there a big snowstorm coming that might, you know, keep me in my driveway for a while? I had an April snowstorm up here a couple years ago. Didn't have as much snow as this, but the sap was up in the trees. We had broken power lines all over the place. Power lines down on either side of me in the street. I couldn't leave. I couldn't go get gas. Luckily, I had an ample supply of fuel. The generator was humming. I was, uh, I was anxious to get out, but I was comfortable, warm, had lights, had computer, had internet. All was good with the world. And uh, that's kind of the story. Anyway, I hope this helps you out, gives you something to think about if you're thinking about moving up to the country. You have to be you know, somewhat self-reliant, at least for a period of time, if you're gonna move up to the country. If you're looking for fishing gear, you know where to go, fishhuntshoot.com. I will catch you next time right here on YouTube and we will get back to talking fishing. I'm Cal Kellogg, have a great day.